Welcome to the Helping Writers Become Authors podcast. I'm K.M. Wyland, and I am here to take you deep with story theory, writing techniques, and the incredible wisdom of story. I believe story is the greatest power on this earth, and that as writers, we carry the torch of wielding that power with responsibility, passion, and skill. There's no such thing as just a story. Today, it is my honor and my purpose to help you write your best story, astound the world, and maybe change your life. Hello and welcome. You're listening to Secrets of Story Structure Part 6, the first half of the second act. Every segment of a story offers its own challenges, but perhaps none leaves writers more bewildered than the second act. At least beginnings and endings provide a checklist of things to accomplish. The middle of the story, on the other hand, is a yawning blank. You may feel like you're entirely without a guide as you try to move your characters toward where they need to be for the ending to work. Fortunately, if you pay attention to story structure, you'll find that the middle of the story has a checklist all its own. The second act is the largest part of your story, comprising roughly 50%. It begins after the first plot point at the 25% mark and continues until the third plot point at the 75% mark. Within the second act, we find three structural beats, once again falling at eighths within the overall structural timing. The first pinch point at the 37% mark, the midpoint or second plot point at the 50% mark, and the second pinch point at the 62% mark. This week, we will discuss the first half of the second act, which includes the first pinch point. Next week, we will devote an entire post to the midpoint, and the following week, we will cover the second half of the second act and the second pinch point. The first half of the second act is the reaction phase of your story. This is where your characters find the time and space to react to the first plot point. So remember how we discussed the first plot point being definitive because it forced the characters into irreversible reaction. That reaction, which will lead to another reaction and another and another, creates your second act. The first plot point hit your characters hard. Now their lives are no longer running on the same smooth paths and they have to do something about it. If you examine the first plot point in a story, you will see it is the character's reactions to the event that change everything and create the story. Even when the first plot point incorporates a life-altering tragedy, for example, the murder of Benjamin Martin's son and the burning of his plantation in The Patriot, the characters could conceivably continue their lives more or less as they had before. It's their reaction, for example, Martin's becoming the ghostly militia leader who terrorizes the British army, that allows the chain of events to continue and create a story. This is why introducing characters and other crucial elements in the first act is so important. If you fail to properly set up the protagonist as someone who would logically react in the way necessary to facilitate the second act, your story will implode. When searching for the appropriate characteristic moment to introduce a character, consider an event that will reflect, inform, or contrast the character's reaction to what happens later at the first plot point. For the next quarter of the book until the midpoint, your characters will react to the events of the first plot point. They will take action, but all these actions are a response to what's happened to them. They're trying to regain their balance and figure out where their lives should go next. For example, in my medieval novel, Behold the Dawn, the characters spend this part of the book on the run from the bishop who wants them dead. In Brent Weeks's The Way of Shadows, the protagonist spends years reacting to the orders of his master. And in Lou Wallace's Ben-Hur, The protagonist is forced into a reactionary role as a galley slave after he's unjustly captured and sentenced at the first plot point. Just because the characters are comparatively reactive in this phase does not mean they are passive. However, even though they are making choices and trying to move forward toward the plot goal, they are not yet able to genuinely be effective in doing so. Not until they reach the moment of truth at the midpoint, while they see themselves in the plot conflict in a clearer light. This will then allow them to switch into an active phase in which their choices and actions become increasingly informed and calibrated in the second half of the second act. 
This is why the first half of the second act is often where the character is learning the rules of the game, whether those are the nuances of a new relationship, the tricks of the trade in a new job, survival skills, or the social structure of a new neighborhood. All right, so let's talk about pinch points. The first and second pinch points are paired beats, both occurring in the second act, one prior to the midpoint and one after. Although pinch points are just as structurally integral as plot points, they won't always be represented by huge scenes. Their primary role is to provide a pinch that reminds the protagonist of the formidable obstacle represented by the antagonistic force and what is at stake should the protagonist fail. The first pinch point takes place halfway through the first half of the second act at the 37% mark. Here, the antagonistic force can flex its muscles and impress with its capacity to disrupt the protagonist's forward momentum. This moment serves primarily to set up the change of tactics the protagonist will soon learn. By reminding readers of the antagonist's power, The first pinch point raises the stakes and foreshadows the central turning point at the midpoint. Like all major structural beats, the first pinch point should focus on the central conflict rather than a subplot. For example, the antagonist might jab at your protagonist's weakness, as in Ever After, when the wicked stepmother exults to Danielle about the probability of her daughter marrying the prince. Or the protagonist might fail in his fight against the antagonist and be mocked or reprimanded for it, as in the film Warrior, when Brendan's brother Tommy rejects his attempts at reconciliation. Or if your story features your antagonist's POV, your first pinch point might simply be a reminder of what the antagonist is planning, as in Captain America, the first Avenger, when the Red Skull murders his superiors and goes rogue, or as in The Empire Strikes Back, when Emperor Palpatine tells Darth Vader that Luke Skywalker is their new enemy. So although the entirety of the first half of the second act is a story's reaction phase, the degree to which the characters shift out of reaction and into action will steadily evolve as they learn new skills. By the time they reach the midpoint, they will encounter a definitive turning point that offers a concrete epiphany about themselves and the nature of the plot conflict. The events at the first pinch point will contribute to that process. Whatever the characters learn at the first pinch point, even if it is just that the antagonist is more formidable than they thought, will fuel their continuing growth toward effectiveness in the plot. The section after the first pinch point and leading up to the midpoint will solidify a state of realization for the protagonist. Think of these realizations as clues, leading the characters to the major revelation at the midpoint. A story's most significant revelations, those that irrevocably change things for the protagonist and thus turn the plot, should be saved for the main structural turning points. However, most stories will require a chain of minor realizations that evolve the character's perspectives leading up to these seismic shifts. For example, in Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence, the midpoint declaration of love is preceded by the section in which the protagonist must internally grapple with and admit he is in love with a woman who is not his fiancée. In Little Women, the midpoint revelation is Joe's quiet truth that life inevitably changes as everyone begins to grow up. This is preceded by a section in which many smaller changes occur, including her best friend Lori going away to college. And in The Martian, the midpoint revelation is the stranded astronaut's acknowledgement that he will probably die on Mars if he continues his current tactics. This is preceded by a section of small tragedies that successively limit his ability to survive. All right, so let's talk about our examples of the first half of the second act from our chosen films and books, starting with Pride and Prejudice. After Bingley leaves Netherfield Park at Darcy's prompting, which was the first plot point, Elizabeth and her sisters can do little except react. Jane goes to London to visit her aunt and to discover why Bingley left. And in the absence of Mr. Wickham, Elizabeth pays an extended visit to her friend Charlotte, the new Mrs. Collins. While there, she again meets Mr. Darcy and is forced to react to his perplexing attentions. 
It's a Wonderful Life. Even after the first plot point in which his father dies of a stroke, George's life could have progressed exactly as he wanted it to. But when he reacts to Mr. Potter's attempts to close down the building and loan by agreeing to stay in Bedford Falls and take his father's place, his life is forever changed. For the next quarter of the movie, we find George adjusting to life in Bedford Falls. When his brother Harry, who was supposed to take George's place in the building and loan, gets married and takes another job, George is again forced to react. He accepts he must stay in Bedford Falls, and he marries Mary Hatch, reactions that build upon his initial decision to preserve the building and loan. Ender's Game After joining Bonzo's Salamander Army, Ender struggles to stay afloat in battle school. He learns to fight and win. In the Zero Grav War Games, he makes friends and enemies and sets in motion the events that will later cause the standoff between him and the bully Bonzo. Everything he does in the first half of the second act is a reaction to his presence in battle school in general and his promotion to Salamander Army in particular. And Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World Captain Jack Aubrey and his crew spend the first half of the second act reacting to their second sighting of the Acheron. After turning the tables on the enemy ship, Jack subsequently loses her during a tragic accident at Cape Horn and is forced to devise new plans and methods for managing his crew until they reach the Galapagos Islands. All right, so the top things to remember about the first half of the second act are, number one, the characters should react promptly and irrevocably to the events of the first plot point. Number two, because the characters' lives and plans have been significantly altered, they must find new ways of dealing with the world in general and the main antagonistic force in particular. Their reactions should be deep and varied enough to create the next quarter of the story. Number two, because the characters' lives and plans have been significantly altered, they must find new ways of dealing with the world in general and the main antagonistic force in particular. Number three, their reactions should be deep and varied enough to create the next quarter of the story. Number four, their reactions must be dominoes, moving the plot forward and deepening the weave of scenes, subplots, and themes. Number five, Often, this section is where the characters will gain the skills or items necessary for the final conflict in the third act. And number six, at the first pinch point, the protagonist will be pressured, either in person or even from afar and without knowing it, by the antagonistic force. The first half of the second act deepens character development and foreshadows meaningful elements. Even in fast-paced action stories, this will often be the most thoughtful portion of your story as you finish building the foundation your characters will stand upon during the climax. So stay tuned. Next week, we will talk about the midpoint, or second plot point. And in the meantime, I hope you'll stop by the site and comment on the post. Do you ever struggle with the second act in your stories? And that brings us to the end of this episode of Helping Writers Become Authors. I hope you'll stop by the site for a full transcript of this episode and to join in the conversation in the comments. Tune in for next week's episode, where we'll continue to explore all things writing and storytelling. If you'd like to support the podcast, it always means a ton when you take a moment to leave a quick rating or review on Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, or Spotify. To stay updated on all the latest content I create for you, the best way is to join my mailing list at helpingwritersbecomeauthors.com slash mailing list. You'll also immediately gain access to lots of free resources, including my books, Crafting Unforgettable Characters and Five Secrets of Story Structure. For real-time connection with me, more writing advice, and behind-the-scenes glimpses, follow me on Instagram at author K.M. Wyland. A heartfelt thank you to each one of you for your support and enthusiasm, and especially those of you who support my work on patreon.com slash kmwyland. You help make my site, this podcast, and so many other resources available to writers everywhere. So until next week, keep writing, keep dreaming, and most importantly, keep being true to your stories. Thank you for being part of Helping Writers Become Authors.